Well, let's start with thinking differently about success because obviously the book is rethinking success and success is a very loaded term yeah. uh, and it's very subjective. And I think many of us may have the wrong message from media and others around what success is and what in your mind is wrong about the current definition of success and why do we need to rethink it? I think, A.G., this, this whole notion of what success is, I think so much of what we've, we've kind of accessed from the way we grew up and our culture is a flawed view. And the view is never enough. It's like, if it's money, how much is really enough? If it's prestige, how much is enough? If it's beauty, how do you stay beautiful? I mean, it's, it just seems like these are inadequate definitions that end up in the same place where you end up lonely and disconnected. And so my thought was, uh, so many of these definitions have to do with your external world. The only definition that really uh, is sustainable in my judgment is a soulish definition, one that really speaks to who you are in your, your, your meaning life. Uh, and I really contrast the two between meaning and happiness because happiness is these externals. I achieved this. My kid got into a good college. I got a raise. I've got a great girlfriend. All great, but they all are, are fleeting and they all can change when you get that pathology report. Meaning by contrast is much deeper. It's a narrative that's a part of who you are. It's the idea of Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning when he says, the people that survived in the death camps were not the physically robust, but those who had an interior life of meaning. Someday I'm gonna meet that grandchild. Someday I'm gonna play the violin again. These are the things that we, and a, frankly, in this COVID moment, we can start investing in because we, the, at least we say we don't have time to invest in those things. The classical music, the, the meditation, reading good books. These are the things that develop the meaning structure of one's life. Learning to meditate, pray, forgive. These are all these things that we, yeah, people would say they're important. But there are they as important as me, you know, killing it at work, me spending another hour doing this. Now you have the time. You have the time. And it's, it's revealing who people really are, I think. It was beautifully said because I think many of us struggle with the fact that we're in this constant cycle of competition and measuring up and everything that you just described, it can't be measured externally. It's internal. I can't measure you by the number of books you read or, or what you're wrestling with internally, but instead I'm measuring you by likes and followers and how much you have in your bank account and what you drive and what you wear. And it's just steered us so far off course from that fulfilling life that we all are looking for. You're absolutely right, AG. And it's, it's funny. I interviewed somebody last week. His name is Dr. Michael Rich up at Harvard. He has the only medical clinic in America this focus is just on issues related, medical issues related to technology, really interesting. And he was talking about how many of these young, particularly young men and women that aren't even in their teens yet, have projected a persona and they are begging their parents that, to get plastic surgery at an age of 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 because now the reality of who they are is not matching the persona they created. And, and you're just saying, where in the hell does that go in 10 years, 15 years? How do you have a relationship, a real relationship, when everything is fraudulent? Everything is not as, as projected. And um, so I, I'm, I'm really worried about, it just seems like this is a perfect storm to create greater unhappiness, the suicide rate, the CD, according to the CDC, since COVID started, 25% of teenagers say they seriously contemplated taking their lives. That's crazy. And, you know, you just say, what is going on here? We, this cultural moment, with all of the affluence, with all the opportunities, with everything we have, 
access to, it's not making us more content. It's not bringing us greater fulfillment. It's actually doing the opposite. There has been a lot of um, studies showing that just with the advent and the and how how many folks are now uh, and how young everyone is exposed to using smartphones and now uh, uh, adopting this other society that they're living in, that the the suicide rates have have skyrocketed. For, yes, especially yeah. for young for for young girls, and but for for everyone across the board and. Th- but it also sets up these expectations of, well, I'll do this after I do this, right? So an example you mentioned with plastic surgery. Well, you know, I'd be happy to do this after I get my nose job. I'll be happy to do this after I lose this much weight. Yeah. You're yeah. now setting up life that will be started once these things happen, where in the past, you you went out and played at the park regardless if you had the nose job or how much you weighed or what it was it was you had to deal with it and there was life lessons around accepting who you were to be able to connect to the other children around you rather than setting up expectations uh that certain things need to be met before you go and socialize before you start this new project. Uh, Johnny, I, I love what you're saying. And an example of that is the playground. So if you go, when I was growing up, where I learned so many of life skills was playing pickup basketball on Saturdays. If you were a jerk, you didn't need an adult to come in. They dealt with you. Your peers dealt with you. What's interesting, you go up to most elementary schools, there's still the basketball hoops, but nobody's there. And because parents are afraid of kidnapping, I mean, 50 other reasons why, oh, we can't allow this this to go on. And so as a result, everything becomes an authoritarian is teaching you how to behave and how to live and coaching your team and doing all this kind of stuff. And the whole notion of an amateur, of experimenting, of imagination, of all these things we we learn when we're bored and have to figure out life, they're not going on. They're not going on. And, and that troubles me tremendously for the future for kids, you know. In the book, you bring up an excellent point, which it's it's not just us slagging on the younger generations. It's not to sound like boomers or doomers. Even successful CEOs at the top right now are feeling lonely, disconnected, struggling, even though outwardly they have all of the trappings of success. And, and we coach these clients who are literally at the top of major corporations but have no friends, no one that they can just go out and socialize with. And they're surrounded by their coworkers and the people that work for them who are paid to give them a certain response and treat them a certain way but they don't have the deeper relationships that drive meaning. You're absolutely right, AJ. And um, it's interesting, I, I cited an Inc. study in there a few years back, and I think it's even worse, but it said out of 3,000 CEOs that were interviewed, uh, half of them self-reported that they were lonely and disconnected. Of that half, 67% said, there's nobody in my life I trust. Now, in any other realm, if you had a stat that strong, you'd say, wow, that's a leadership crisis. But because it's in this weird area of loneliness, we kind of say, well, I don't understand that, but we walk away from it. But it's, it's tragic. And I'd say, I, I tell my MBA classes this, because yeah, I, I have men and women in there. I say, guys, you have a particular problem in this area. You were taught from a young age not to not to communicate or be in touch with things of the heart so you've learned a certain way of of not connecting and a way of associating so you play golf you do sports you go to a music venue but you're not ever really talking and women sit down if you ever eavesdrop which i've done a lot you'll see three women walking you eavesdrop they're talking about stuff that really matters. They're really comfortable in this space. 
So I, I say to my class, this might be the last chance you have to learn a language of the heart. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's out of your comfort zone. But if you don't learn that, you're gonna be another casualty of another lonely man that, that wonders how they got here. And so, so it's, it's vital. And I also tell the, my class that the stats say between 30 and 45, you start shedding relationships. And it's because life takes over, you're busy and all that. So you've got to figure out what matters to you and to, to stay connected to some, a few people. The first day of my MBA class, I think it was three years ago, where I, I, I tell them the first day of class is I said, your point of identity with everybody in this class is not how smart you are or how accomplished, but your weakness. We're all broken. We're all frauds on levels that are unimaginable. So this guy on the front row says, Professor, I've been trying to get in this class for a long time, finally in, so I'm going to be all in. He said, I had a debilitating stutter my whole life, which made me live in the shadows, but I was very strong academically. Didn't have any friends, go off to college, sophomore year, decided I'm going to take my life because, you know, I'm, my life's empty. I have no one that cares about me or I care about. But before I do that, I'm going to go out and try to have a couple conversations and tell people how screwed up I am and try to talk and they're just going to ridicule me. This will reinforce how messed up I am. And then it's going to be all over anyway. So he's telling us this the first five minutes of class. And he says, I said, well, what happened, Clark? He said, well, two things. The more I started to share, the less I stuttered. And second, people started telling me about their weak areas, where they were broken, where they were needy. And then he paused, like for dramatic effects. said, guess what else, Professor? I said, what else, Clark? He said, I'm the student body president of my MBA class. I have to give speeches all the time. So I being the smart ass that I am, I said, okay, Clark, and this is the class of winners. You, uh, Clark is obviously a loser. So we're going to take a break and probably a lot of you want to transfer out of this course because who would want to be with somebody like Clark? <laughs> and so, so I said, how many of you want to transfer out? Nobody, of course, raised their hand. I said, how many of you feel safer because of what Clark shared? They all raised their hand. I said, if you learn nothing else in this class, this is the game changer. This is it. Your point of identity is not what you think it is. It's on a different level. It's your weakness. You know, th this brings up a point that you, uh, a, a stat that you brought up from John Gottman that s stuck out to me. And I don't know if I run into this one before. However, in our classrooms and separating what you think is going on and what actually is going on, this this stat really hit it home where it it takes five good interactions to offset one bad interaction isn't that stunning and now i've always been in, in our classrooms i've talked about if you're going to criticize yourself at least give yourself uh equal equal that scale never let that scale tip and, but this is like, we need to stack the good to beat out. The we <laughs> need to stack it. And he says, he, he, he does this. He said he can sit with somebody in an hour, a, a couple, and he can tell you in a one hour interaction, he can find out if they're going to make it. And so much of it has to do with this. But I was thinking that is really hard to do, <laughs> you know, to really invest emotionally and, and this comes to something else I mentioned in the book, this idea of catching people doing the right thing. You know, the way most of us grew up is, oh, Joe, you left your shoes out. Oh my gosh, you're so messy. This, that. But to have the same emotional energy, hey, Johnny, come in here. I need to talk to you. Guess what, Johnny? I just want to tell you, I love the questions you ask around the dinner table. They are so killer. Who does that? None of us do it because we're, we've been so programmed to find fault. So we think with our significant others, if I just straighten her out one or two more times, then it's all, she's going to like that or he's going to like that. 
that program doesn't work. <laughs> we, we've all tried that. <laughs> a point made in the book that I think is so powerful and I've been working on myself is this concept of forgiveness. It's the same thing. You know, we, we judge others harshly and then we, we never actually come back around and let them off the hook. So we're judging ourselves hard and we don't practice forgiveness enough. And as you talk about, that is really the key to that fulfilling life. We are all going to fail. We are all going to make mistakes and they're with the best intentions. Very, very, very few people, unless they are wired wrong or have major mental issues, are trying to hurt you. They're trying to do the best with the tools that they have and they are going to step on your toes. They are going to say things out of off turn. They are going to hurt you. Not purposefully, we need to practice and cultivate forgiveness in others to open the door to more of these connections. And when we talk to clients, you know, they write people off so quickly. They look for these faults, whether it's in their dating life or their social life, or even when they're looking for a job. And then they wonder why they're sitting there stewing in this unhappiness and this lack of success that they're after. And I think that's a powerful message from Jesus is, is that idea of forgiveness, regardless of how religious you are. Yeah, forgive as you have been forgiven. I think a lot of us, you remember in this book by C.S. Lewis, the Oxford scholar, he said, he said, you know, I've always been taught that you're supposed to forgive as you've been forgiven. Then he said that I realized there was somebody that I always had no problem forgiving um, when, when he did wrongdoing. He said it was myself. I always <laughs> gave myself the benefit of the doubt, but nobody else out there. But, but, but this forgiveness thing is, is something. But, but, AJ, this goes back, I think, to the story we were born into. And, and you know, if you want to understand so much about yourself, uh, you know, I say to people a lot of time, how many of you in this room grew up with raging, angry families? And I'd say about half of them do that. I said, I'm just going to tell you not to scare you, but this is going to be your narrative unless you honestly look at that and pivot, find a way to pivot. Because what you have seen is what you emulate. Modeling, I don't care what your parents told you to do, what they live is what you're gonna model. I don't think there's enough attention to be put on what healthy relationships look like. And when I think about where could you see examples of that, nothing pops into my mind. You, you, you have to, you have to go out and, and search of, of you really what did. that is. And it's, it's just not prevalent. I guess maybe it, 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 it doesn't warrant the attention as dysfunction warrants. Uh, dysfunction brings attention, whether you want it or not, but, but healthy relationships, I guess they seem kind of boring. So no one wants to, to exploit that, but, but, if everything around us is set up to get that attention, th th then that's what the dysfunction is. What's going to seem normal. Yeah. More familiar. And that's what we've seen so much of the time and we're surrounded by it. And you're right. You're right. If you look at that, Johnny, and you say, if you said to me, Doug, name 10 really great relationships, couples, I, ha I <laughs> could maybe come up with a few, but it's going to take me some time. <laughs> and that's kind of sad. I'm a member of a men's group that I host uh, every Monday here at my place. And just last night, we were talking about this exact thing around the definition of love and, and what a healthy, fulfilling relationship is. And it's not the avoidance of conflict. It's not smooth sailing, which is what, unfortunately, many of us view as healthy relationships. But it's actually what you do after the conflict, after something has slighted the other person where there's a difference of opinions or perspectives or someone's behavior has hurt someone else. It's in those moments after. How do you come back together? How do you solve that as a team? How do you stay committed to the relationship that you've built? Not to your identity and who's right or wrong in these situations, but we don't have that modeling in culture. We don't have that in movies. We don't see that on TV. We're not seeing it in politics as we know. We're, we're just not seeing it anywhere. So we don't have that frame of reference. And we always resort back to, okay, well, I have to portray outwardly that everything is going well. Otherwise, I don't look successful. Otherwise, other people aren't going to judge me as successful. And you talk about we need to find our own story. But part of this is also pushing back on what other people are 
telling us is our story, right? So your parents have a story for you. Your friends, your peers have a story for you. It may not be the right one. And I know many in our audience feel that way. So what is your advice to not only find your own story, but to push back and say no to the stories that others envision for us? First step, it seems like when you're lost in the woods is to declare that you're lost. And I think first is to say, what are those things that are shaping me? What are the messages that in my, in my, among my friends, among my family that I get? Get more education. Because, like I remember in my, my class, a lot of the Southeast Asian uh, people, in my students in my class, what's really valued is to be a professional, an engineer or a doctor. I had one guy, this father would not talk to him because he went to get an MBA and not a medical degree. He said, what do I do? I said, you've got a choice. You could live your father's story or your story. I said, it might take some time for this to get back on track, but do you want to really live his story your whole life? So I would say, you know, it, it's, it's like, I think it was E.E. E. Cummings that said, to, to be yourself in a world that's teaching you every day to be something other than yourself is the bravest thing any of us could ever do. So it takes uh, bravery. So I'd say, number one, it takes bravery. Number two, I think to, to spend time every day and reset and say, what are the messages that I'm going to be getting? And are they valid? Are they worthy of me embracing as if they're true? I think a lot of people don't. That's why I, I say we all have to have a meditative practice where it, you step back and you pause and you say, you know, these people, what they're saying to me, it sounds good, but is that really who I am? So I think you need to have your own voice. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, there's a lot of literature, you know, a, a great book, uh, Lonely Crowd by David Reisman, who is up at Harvard, talks about, you know, there, there, these audiences that we all buy into. If you're a Hasidic Jew and live in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 90% uh, of your life's already circumscribed. How you dress, what you believe, who you marry, how you think, and same with Quakers, Mormons, all these different things. So you have to decide who is your audience. And I love, I think it's, uh, I think it's the Quakers had the best formulation I know. They said, we should live to please an audience of one. Now, whether you interpret that as God or yourself, to say at the end of the day, the most evolved version of me has to be to say, I'm okay with that. I'm a fourth grade teacher, you're an I banker. And I'm okay with being a fourth grade teacher. I have come to peace with that because I've done the work. And you've got to do the work of reading, thinking, meditating, counseling, whatever it takes so that you are really comfortable in your skin. Because if you're not, you're going to be more of a reflector of others. What do you want me to be? And that's, that's the culture we're in on steroids. That You look at the, the broken political culture, and you're saying, does anybody have the guts to step up and say, this is wrong? But sadly, they don't have the interior fortitude to do it. And there's, there's a piece there where because they're – they're looked at by a crowd that they're trying to please. There's this idea that if I just do this well enough, I'll eventually fall in line. But you are constantly going to be fighting your inner self for the rest of your life. I've been in a room. We've been running programs for 15 years. AJ and I have been in rooms where all of a sudden a 30-year-old young man or 25-year-old young man realizes the point where they accept that they have been living somebody else's life. Now there's, once that hits, the walls of reality come crashing down. There's a moment of panic, but it's, listen, we're now going to make, take steps towards you living to, for, for yourself. And every day after this, that you do this gets better than the day before. Oh, I love that. that. That's fantastic. It's a magical moment, but it's terrifying. And that's 
the thing about it, it in, in my sharing my story in, in class, my, my dad was a blue collar guy, didn't go to college. Very important to him that I not only went to college, but he wanted me to become a doctor. I got into graduate school working on cancer biology, PhD, and I just knew it was not for me. And every day going to the lab, I knew more and more I did not want to do this. I was living someone else's dream. And there was not some epiphany. There was not the heavens parting and angels saying, AJ, you need to do this. I just selfishly said, I, I'm done. That's enough. And I, I dropped out and started this company. And guys in the room, when they hear that story, they're, they're wrestling with these same things, but they just don't have the courage to break those chains of uh, others' expectations of them and others' definition of success. And they need to hear from more people who've done that, who've liberated themselves from this mindset to find it in yourself. And that's where the fulfillment comes from because the choice is now mine. It's not my dad's choice. It's not my classmate's choice. It's not my professor's choice of how my life is going to go. Now it's mine. And when you take that responsibility and that choice back, well, that opens the door to this fulfillment that everyone is wrestling with. Well, imagine living in the being the person that every day you get to be the best person that you want to be rather than trying to figure out how to be the best person that somebody else <laughs> wants you to wants be. You yeah, be. <laughs> that is really important. And you know, the way this starts, it's really interesting. Uh, I ask people sometime this question. I said, when do you ever remember a time in your life where you stood alone? Because my take on successful, bright people is they all want optionality. They never, it's like these senators today. They know things are wrong, but they never want to draw the line because someday I might need this and that. So they never draw a line. And I, I feel like one of the most powerful things we can do for ourselves or our children is to say there are certain times when you got to say on principle, no, I will not do this. Sadly, it took me till I was about 19 before I did it that I recall for the first time ever. Up to that point, I just was a total suck up and just did whatever, you know, successful people did. But I, I finally had to decide, who am I? And uh, it was a great choice, a hard choice. And so I think all of us, um, there has to be that moment. And I think, sadly, a lot of people never know that. The other thing I'd say is life is really short. And you got to decide. You know, most people spend their life preparing to live and never living. And it's almost like I saw it at Goldman Sachs. I had all these people that would say, God, Doug, you've done so many cool things when you're a diplomat and all this. He said, they all said the same thing. When I make a lot of money someday, I'm going to go do that. Here's the problem with that narrative. You are becoming something every day. So when you finally get to that, that you know, imaginary point where you have the freedom to do that, you don't even know what the hell to do. You don't, you forgot any, any high-minded purpose you had for your life. And the other is so comfortable because you've done it for so long. We're becoming something every day. We need to integrate these worlds. We need to find out what does it mean to be a school teacher and be alive and really thrive? What does it mean to be a banker and to be alive? You know, there's this great story told about, um, this, this woman in New York, she was the art critic for the New York Times. She was getting uh, a new um, a dishwasher put in her apartment in New York. So the, the plumber comes up and she looks at him and says, uh, you know, has anybody ever told you you have a resemblance to this epic kind of one of the great composers of our time, Philip Glass? the the composer and he says well i am philip glass but i'm philip glass the plumber <laughs> <laughs> and he said he said you know i love working with my hands i'm a plumber but also i'm pretty good at mu creating music and i still do this sometimes it keeps me grounded and it's really funny a lot of people did this you know a lot of authors a lot of people uh, you know who who really did, you know, 
did their craft, whether it was being a lawyer or whatever it was, and did their artistic thing on the side. So I, I, I say to people, um, and, and Johnny, you'll appreciate this as a musician, I draw two circles. I said, circle one over here are the things you gotta do. You gotta pay the rent, you gotta eat, you gotta do all this. So you put all those over here, that's probably called a job, whatever it is to get cash to do that. Then the other circle is what makes you come alive. Creating music, you know, writing poetry, playing the classical piano. I don't know what it is in that circle. I said, there are two circles. Now, some of you, and I say this to my class all the time, I ask them, how many of you had something you absolutely loved when you were up till you're 25? They all raise their hand. What was it? I was, I love writing poetry. I love composing music. I love uh, mountain climbing. They all had something. I said, how many of you are still doing it? Three out of 40. The problem is in these two circles, they have, we're in a world with the American Idol. If I'm a musician, I can't just love music because I love it. I have to have a, a big record deal. I have to do all this stuff. So I say to them, do the stuff to make a living. Keep pursuing one or two of your passions. If you're lucky, they might over, overlap. And guess what? Maybe you can get paid for what you do and what you love. My two oldest boys are fortunate because they get paid to do what they love, but it's not a sure thing. And I just say to people, don't stop playing the guitar because you're, you're not going to win American Idol. Just if you love the guitar, keep playing it. I can't say how many, I, I can't count the number of times people ask me when I'm going to grow up. And I, and I, my, first of all, it's, it's always, what do you mean by that? And they're like, well, you know, the going out to the clubs, playing in bands. I'm like, well, why wouldn't you, I? Well, like, I can't imagine my life with, without that. And I can, and there's going to be a time when I'm unable to perform at the level that I want to. And there's going to also be a time where people are not going to want to come out to see me perform at that level. And until either of those things happen, I'm going to continue playing music because of how much joy, perspective, um, fulfillment that it, that it gives me in my everyday life. That is, I love what you're saying, Johnny. And I feel like, like again, that comes back to bravery. It's learning to be you and you, all these voices that are coming at us, trying to make a, it's almost like you have 50 people that are miserable saying, hey, Johnny, come on, man, be miserable and grown up like us. It's exactly what it is. It's, it's the craziest crap I've ever seen. It's almost like it's a threat to people when somebody's fully alive. So, so that's what, but you have to be brave. The other thing I feel like, Johnny, you have to have one or two people in your life that are there for you, that believe in you and what you're doing and understand the quirkiness and the craziness and they aren't threatened by it. But so many people don't like differences because it's threatening to them. Differences are threatening. Absolutely. The unknown, getting outside of our comfort zone is threatening. And we've cocooned ourselves in this vision of, of comfort. But it, again, as we talk about success, that's not found in your comfort zone. That's not found in retreating. That's not found in giving up on these things that really matter to you. Now, you bring up an interesting point with the, the circles because many people have heard this advice. You can find it everywhere on social media. A lot of people are touting it. You just have to find your passion and then everything else works. And you mention it. That is, that is so lucky. That if you just sit there waiting to monetize your passion, your whole life is going to pass before your eyes. Very few people are fortunate enough to do that for their entire lives. There will be moments when those circles overlap and you should celebrate them and love every second of it and realize there are going to be moments when those circles are completely separate and that's okay too. But we've yes. been sold this dream of like, 
This is your passion. Pursue your passion. And many people listening to us are like, well, these guys are doing their passion. Guess what? Doing my taxes, that's not my passion. There are a lot of things that go along in that circle of paying your rent yeah. that are not defined as passion. And if you are constantly setting passion as north on your compass, you're going to be steered off the map and you're going to struggle to really find where that fulfillment lies. It's doing the tough stuff. It's doing the stuff you don't want to do. That is real truth, what you're saying. And I, I blame parents like me where we thought we were doing the right thing by saying, you know, I've got one son that was a division one golfer and all that. Oh, you can be, you can win the tour. You can be number one in the world, all this kind of stuff. And you're saying, really, what, what are we setting people up for? So I, I think I came to it the hard way with these two circles, understanding that you can have your passion, but you don't have to necessarily get paid to do your passion. What's wrong with that? But I think these instant success shows and all the stuff is almost creating the wrong thing. It's like I show up one day and I win and I have the biggest record deal. I'm a multimillionaire. It's easy. It ain't easy. Yeah. <laughs> I live in LA. Johnny used to live in LA and we even see this with influencers and, and you know, YouTube stars and, and creators that there's a lot that goes into creating. That's not fun. That's not passion driven and caring about views and all the other stuff that goes along with it. But again, the representation online that we get, that snapshot, that brief moment, we ascribe to success. We yeah. fantasize and fetishize yeah. this idea of passion equals a life fulfilled. It's about creating space for your passion, but not relying solely on passion to be that motivator or driver. I can see my MBA students almost relieved because they say, wow, okay, this is a different way of thinking about it. Now I have true optionality because I can really take a normal job, but I don't have to give up on this. And I don't have to die to what everything that made that I loved in my life. It sounds like you've been unchaining your students the way we've been unchaining our clients to these ridiculous expectations and a, and a way forward that that allows them to find fulfillment in ways that they've never been privy to or didn't even realize that were there. And, and you've brought up religion multiple times in the book. And, and, and for whatever reason, it just gets such a bad rap. And But everything that you're going to see in a secular way of meditating or uh, gratitude practice. These have been religious staples <laughs> for every religion the, the dawn of time. So you either take it with the religion or you take it without, but these are fundamental blocks in for your fulfillment, regardless of how you want to look at it. The, yeah, Johnny, I always say to people, the ingredients to the stew of meaning are knowable. These aren't brain science. And I, I take a group of CEOs every year to a monastery where, the, where they chant. And I'd say half of the people are not at all religious. But I just said, look, this is a timeless thing that's been going on for thousands of years. It'll change your life because it stills you. You start thinking about the numinous and what really matters. And they've nailed something really powerful. So, but, you know, it's like, and I, and I, I give them a, a little notebook with all blank for them to take notes, but I have a quote by Pascal as they open it and his 1666 unfinished book called Ponces in French, it means thoughts. And he said this, the fundamental problem of a person is never learning to be alone within four walls. And you think about it with social media. It is a big deal when I ask my MBA class, leave all your technology here, everything, and for one hour, just go off by yourself and think. Oh my God, and I said, now when you come back, I want you to spend a half hour and record, what feelings did you have? Anxiety, oh my God, I'm missing out, what's the thing? It, that's astonishing to me. Creating the space and you, you brought up a concept a little earlier that I want to talk about because a lot of people talk about work-life balance 
and trying to figure that out. And, and you mentioned the, the book, The Silo Effect and silos and, and how do we break through all of this and create that integrated life? And what does that even mean for those in our audience who've never heard it put that way? Yeah, you know, uh, this, this notion of a balanced life, I just think it's a bunch of BS. I don't buy it at all. But here's what I do believe. I believe there are seasons in your life. And seasons, there are some seasons when you're all in, some season, not so much. And so when I was on the White House staff, if you left at nine at night, people would, would kid you and say, well, you're working a half day. Now, that's okay for a season. If you do that for two, two and a half years, you can sustain it. But if in 40 years you're doing that, that's not a good, that's not sustainable. <clears throat> but if I would have said to them, okay, guys, uh, I'm going to go work out at five. I'm going to do this. They're going to say, great, go get another job. That's good. But I think you've just got to do that. And the, and the whole family has to be on board with that. I think that's the problem a lot of times. That, you know, you, when I went up to New York and I knew how busy it was going to be, my wife and I had to say, are we on the same page? This is going to be our life for a while. But are we willing, are we, are we in this together or not? If we're not, let's not do it. If we are, let's own it together. I have to say that makes all the sense in the world. And it's much more natural than trying to figure out this balance. And to be aware of it, to know we're going to be, this is a full season. We're going to get into it for at least the next six months. Is everyone prepared for what is going yeah. to happen? That is when wonderful. You, when, when you started this company, AJ, you didn't say, well, you know, I think I'll spend a couple hours every day. To, <laughs> you either, it's like, I, I got to make this work. I don't know how the hell it's going to work. I'm putting everything on the line. Plus, eyes are looking at me saying, God, you gave up a promising career as a medical researcher to do what? And so you're like, hey, guys, I think I'm going to be all in and try. This might fail, but it isn't because I didn't work. Well, I just have to say, and even looking at this company through that lens of seasons, that makes all the, the sense in the world. And um, because of COVID and some new things that we have going on, AJ and I are having a season where we're, we're full in. Yeah. And, but, and it's wonderful, but that is a... That is such a, a healthier lens to, to look at it. And sometimes there's not going to be as much going on. You're looking to create some momentum. You are trying different things. You're taking a step back to see how look. But the minute you, you grab, the minute there's momentum, you want to ride that. So it's absolutely and not feel bad about it. Right. But to feel good. It's an important message because so many people have bought into that and they're chasing that. And it's a false God. It's not worth chasing. I mean, I've never met anybody that has a work-life balance. That's full stop for, for openers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will say there's been a few uh, people that we've interviewed who I've just loved, who had great energy. And now they're, they're in their the middle age and they're 50 years old. They're looking at each day of winning the day of, of maximizing their fun and well-being and in trying to incorporate because they've realized that everything else that they've tried in their life, as successful as they are and have been, they weren't and they were not happy. Yeah, absolutely. The happiness research shows that if you can tap into that purpose, you can invest in quality relationships and you move your body. That's the bulk of the battle. It's yeah, not yeah. chasing this little hit of dopamine and, and trying to reinvent the wheel. Again, it's the same ingredients to the stew. The stew of happiness is move your body, invest in relationships. And when I say invest, warts and all. Don't yeah. just show yeah. them your social media yeah. feed. Don't just pretend that you're <laughs> this guy who has it or gal who has it all together. But be real with people and don't be afraid of sharing that vulnerability. And the third of is you got to dig deeper to that purpose and we all have it in us, but many of us stop searching and just go, well, my dad said this and oh, my peers are doing this and I can't start a business until I have the MBA. And, and we make all these excuses and roadblocks to finding that real purpose. Totally agree. Totally agree. So it's almost like uh, what we need to do. I think one of you mentioned this is 
elevate people that are thinking differently, that by definition, they're more maverick. And that gives the rest of us permission. You know, it was funny, always the court, the court gesture would always say the, the things everybody was thinking to the king. And the king would accept them from him because he was just a fool and would do it. But it almost liberated everybody and said, you know, he just told the king and he's fat. You know, and that's... <laughs> And then we could all have a laugh. Yeah, right? we could all laugh because they said, you know, we all are thinking this stuff, but nobody has the courage to do it. This is why I, I am a great believer in being in a small group in some way. You know, when people start sharing their challenges and where they are, it might not be the same problem you have, but the fact that someone is being vulnerable, you say, that's where we connect on our, our common humanity, our common frailty. And you leave feeling, wow, we all, it's, it's almost like this great book by Henry Nouwen. It wasn't a great book, but the title was terrific. Henry Nouwen wrote this book called The Wounded Healer. And I love that. He said, we're all wounded, but we're all capable of being healers in each other's lives. And I think, you know, what people want is, not advice they want you to be real because that's the connecting tissue and i think it when you pivot and, and say okay so what kind of leaders do we need today <clears throat> i'd say people don't want perfect leaders they want authentic leaders they want people that are real you know i love churchill oh my i'm reading the uh splendid and the vile right now and what a character i mean there was nothing <laughs> yeah. about him that was normal he had bipolar, he called it the Black Plague. I mean, he was just out there, drank a bottle of Paul Roger champagne before noon, was in his pajamas most of the day, but he was honest with the British people. He said, I don't know if we're at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. And this little pinprick of an island stood against the mighty Nazi regime because one person believed the counter narrative. Everyone else said appeasement, give in, doesn't matter. <clears throat> this is the kind of leaders we need and this is what we don't have today. Let's wrap with a challenge for our audience because we are trying to build better leaders on this show. What challenge do you have for our audience this week to engage in those core values to help them maybe find that purpose or just to take a different look at success to unlock something in themselves? I would say there's a couple things you could do very practically. I'd say one, decide for five days out of the next seven to take two minutes and just be still with no technology in your hand, but just hear yourself breathe. I would say that's one. Two, if you aren't an exerciser, don't start I remember one time my son went to see this uh, trainer and it was like 40 exercises listed. I said, this will never happen. <laughs> if you haven't been an exerciser, I think AJ said it about move. Walk around the block. Don't walk, don't sign up for a marathon. Don't start lifting weights. Don't start running for three miles. Walk for two minutes around the block. I'm a great believer in celebrating success, building on the small things. If you're, if you're drinking a bottle of wine a night and you don't think that's working for you, okay, don't give it all up. You know, just decide two nights of the week, I'm not gonna have anything. So insinuate certain practices into your routine and you'll start to see behavior change and it'll start feeling better. And so I'd say little things like that. The last thing I'd say would be gratitude. Maybe while you have that two minutes, you're still for two minutes and then you have an index card and you write down two quick things you're grateful for. I just had a dark roast cup of Italian coffee. Uh, the sun shining in LA today. There's no fires, whatever it is. You write them down, period. Neuroscientists tell us it changes the, the brain chemistry when we do that. So those little things, creating space, walking around the block, 
writing down two things you're grateful for. And then, you know, with the drinking or whatever you do, try to insinuate a little time when you don't do as much, but don't, don't get crazy. And most people, I've, ne I've never met somebody that says to me, Doug, I want to tell you, this is a great day. I just finished a diet. Nobody finishes a diet. Everybody starts a diet. My view is do something for about three days and then freaking celebrate it. It's so important. And we, we practice this with our clients and our X Factor mentorship. Every single session starts off with wins. And it doesn't matter how small they are, because as Johnny said earlier, we're always tipping the scale in the critical. We're always adding the things we should be doing, we could be doing, we aren't doing. We're never adding to the other side of the scale, the positive momentum that neuroscience says we have to rewire our brain and it's baby steps to do it. You're not going to rewire your brain overnight, but doing those small practices over time lead to that greater success. Just like a diet. You just, you don't stop going, oh, I've rewired it. I'm good now. No, <laughs> this is a, a practice that if you want these results, you have to continue and put these in your life that you're doing for the rest of your life. Your diet is something that you are happy about that keeps you feeling good and active and have tons of energy. And then you roll with that to the rest of your life and you make adjustments as needed. These mindsets work in the same way. You just don't rewire things. You stop and, you, and, you, and you're good to go. No, your brain is wired one way. We're working on exercises and practices that help it fire in, the, in a way that helps and supports and encourages and fulfills you rather than one leaving you feeling empty and anxiety ridden. That, that, that's well said. Well said. And, and it starts small. Just, just build one, one brick at a time. But it's almost like you think of other practice in your life. There's this thing called stacking where you might say something you're already doing every day. Let's say you're brushing your teeth two times a day. Okay. Stack. So in other words, maybe you do five push-ups when you brush your teeth in the morning. Not, not a whole weight training program. You just do them. And guess what? You're going to start feeling a little bit tighter and it feels, it kind of feels good. Hey, I'm going to brush my teeth tomorrow. So, so just things you're already doing that are unconscious make Autopilot. these other things unconscious eventually. Absolutely. One last question for you, Doug, before we jump. We love asking every guest of ours what their X factor is. And we believe everyone has a unique X factor. It's when a mindset unlocks a skill set that makes you extraordinary. What do you think your X factor is? That's a good question. I think I've been fearless. I've never been qualified for anything, but I've done it so often that I'll show up any place and figure it out. So this is a great example. I'll never forget. I made a documentary. Uh, it was, we did it on for WGBH um, with a Harvard psychiatrist that did this. But I get a call from the Emmy people, right? And they asked me to be a judge. I know nothing about this world. But did I say, tell them all the reasons why? I said, hell no. I, so I show up there. Four of us watched movies all day. We decided who got the Emmys in this category. And I'm like, this is crazy. But yes, this is a story in my life. And I kind of love it that, <laughs> that I just said, I'm going to try to really do the best I can here. But it was a blast. I never feel qualified for anything. I know so many people who are so qualified, but they, they talk to themselves nonstop. Their fears dictate how they live their life. The worst you can do is fail. And who cares? <laughs> exactly. There's a good story to be had either way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The book is Rethinking Success. Is there anywhere you'd like our audience to visit or check out? Uh, we, I've got a uh, landing page. It's www.dougholliday, H-O-L-L-A-D-A-Y.com. Has a lot of interviews and craziness like this. The book you can get on Amazon, I guess, or any of those places. Uh, HarperCollins published it. And, 
you know, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, I just want to say for your audience, these guys are doing something really important. You're talking about the things everyone thinks about nonstop, but they never talk about it. We got to get it out of the closet and say, it's okay to talk about what really matters. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doug. We appreciate it. Love yeah, the book. Yeah, thank you guys. Best of success with the launch. Bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>